In Islam, a Muslim man cannot reject marriage with a nine-year-old because of her age. The only reason he would reject is because he's not a faithful Muslim. Well, you're also her guardian, so you'd be able to object. Do you understand what I just said? In Islam, a guardian cannot object to his nine-year-old being married to a Muslim because of her age. The only reason he rejects because he's not pious enough. There is no grounds for the father not to give his nine-year-old because it is Muhammad's example and it's part of 65 verse 4 the Quran and it's part of Sharia that you can marry a nine-year-old. The father would still have to consent. And he consents. And the fact that you're even trying to just fight shows how sick and dangerous you are. If he were to go to a mufti and said, the father is not allowing me to marry his nine-year-old because she's nine, he would be considered a kafir because then he's going against Muhammad Sunnah. Yeah, the reason isn't because she's the, like the letter, the number age. It's just because that he doesn't want her to. Oh, to. okay, good. So you admit the age is okay, though. It's not like it's, a number. It's not like a number. Well, thing. it's okay if she's nine. He wouldn't say no, 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 no. She's immature, right? Well, the parent would have to consent. So if he doesn't consent, it's not because of her age, right? If he doesn't consent, then there's probably some reason why he doesn't. But not the age, right? It cannot be the age. Islamically speaking, according to Sunnah Sharia. He cannot reject because of her age. Can you prove that? If I have to prove it, you know, I'm going to tear Muhammad to shreds. Yes, I can. Your prophet's example, chapter 65, verse 4 of the Quran, all of your commentaries and your Muslim scholars. If I need to prove that, man, you are one sick human being for becoming a Muslim without understanding Islam. Prove that go. the person must accept. If a Muslim man wants to marry his nine-year-old, if he rejects it on the ground she's too young, he's an unbeliever. He can't he can't reject on the grounds of that she's age nine, alive. she's too young. It has to be some other reason. No, so we you, establish so, that, right? So we agree it's not only the the, the number Notice how you age just twisted my words again. You see how you just twisted my words? You said, Do we agree it's not only? See, you're lying. I didn't say that. I said he cannot object because she's young. Why are you twisting my words? No, no, no. It's, you said young, but that's not the that's not the issue. Nine, okay, nine is not young. The the age nine. Okay. So let's try it again, you demonized misfit. Can a Muslim, if he is a Sunni and faithful to Muhammad, say you cannot marry my nine-year-old because she's too young? I'm saying he has the grounds to object. Let me repeat the third her. time, you dyslexic. You demonized dyslexic. Okay. According to the Sunnah, a Muslim man cannot say to a Muslim, you cannot marry my daughter because she's nine. He cannot reject it because of her age. Yes or no? Because I'm All about right, to post your prophet. The, 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 you said there was an Islam QA link. Could you share that? Here it is. Islam question and answer. General Supervisor Sheikh Mohammed Saleh Munajid. Is there a set age for marriage in Islam? And the answer is no. But they removed it. Gee, I wonder why. How convenient, huh, guys? They removed it. Oh, wow. They removed this one too. Islamweb.net. Wow, guys. All the links where the Muslim scholars admit, like Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, al Fath al-Bari, volume 11, page 25, which is still in the Arabic, they removed. Ibn Hajar al Askanani is the commentator on Sahih al-Bukhari. You can read this still in Arabic, but they had it online. And it comes from Fath al-Bari, volume 11, page 25, library, islamweb.net, and they removed it. Gee, I wonder why. Muslim schools of jurisprudence unanimously allow the marriage of young girls, even if they were still babies in the cradle. But intercourse cannot occur until the girl can withstand penetration. Thank you, way back. Guys, get on the ball right now. Save it. There it is. Save it, please, before it's even removed from the way back. I'm not going to update the link. In fact, I'm going to take the entire article and upload it. All right. Now, here's the part that I quote in my paper. Are you ready? C could you just quote from the Islam? Yeah. Community? Well, here, find it. Open up. It says, firstly... Islam does not give a specific age for marriage. Do you see that? Yep. Okay. And yeah, what I'm does he put to prove to prove that point? Chapter 65, verse 4, right? Okay. So what did I say to you earlier? No Muslim can object to a man marrying a nine-year-old because of her age. Because you just read there is no age for marriage, no age limit, because of 65, verse 4, which envisions a scenario of young girls who haven't had puberty, premature, previous, and minors, who well, haven't had puberty, who have been married and had sex and divorced. And here, let me read what it says, Tafsir al-Sadbi. Al-Sadbi said, along with those who, who have it not, who have not had their menses, means minors, those who have not yet started to menstruate. Ah, uh, you caught it? And now let's go to, with regard to females, the father may give his minor virgin daughter who has not yet reached the age of nine in marriage, and there is no difference of opinion concerning that. So you can even give a woman in marriage before nine, but watch the condition, right? There is no difference of opinion concerning that if he gives her in marriage to someone who is compatible. Ibn al-Mundir said, all of those scholars from whom we acquired knowledge unanimously agree 
that it is permissible for a father to give <coughs> his minor daughter in marriage if he arranges her to someone who's compatible. And it is permissible for him to do that even if she is reluctant. You know, the only condition is before nine. Let's the only switch. condition is if she's before nine, she must be able to handle penetration. But then it says when she's nine, you can penetrate whether she can handle it or not. Yeah, you need to be married in order to... Yes, but do you understand what it's saying? Because Aisha was nine when Muhammad penetrated her. That's not true. I mean, it's not, not, it's not, they have what's to be the, physically, wait, wait, they have to be physically uh, mature. No, enough. read it. Yeah. I just quoted it. It's there and it's online. Who are you lying to? It says nine, then you can penetrate. Who are you lying to, man? I gave it right in front of your eyes. Uh, at the bottom of the first Islam QA, it says, fourthly, a man should not consummate marriage with, with his young bride until she is physically able to okay, bear finish it. it. Keep going because it says, but if she's nine, then you can penetrate. Finish it. No, I'm using the first one that we were on before. Keep reading. Um, this varies from one time, place, and environment to another. Uh, what young men and guardians of girls should do is hasten to arrange marriages so as to guard chastity and protect honor as yeah. and, yeah, and so as to attain. Here's the part. You're, you're taking to a, here's the part. It's, it's in the comments. Read that for me. I just sent it to you. No, I'm reading the, the first one that I sent. Can you way read back. that part? Because by the time you get to this part, it's going to be midnight. Can you read it, please? And it's from Islam q and I just sent it to you in private. Don't make me read it for you. Read it. Husband and the read it loud. I'm trying to read it from the website. I need to find it. Okay, find the part where it says, if the husband and the guardian of the girl agreed upon something. If the husband and the guardian of the girl agree upon something that will not cause harm to the young girl, then it may be done. Keep going. If they disagree, then Ahmad and Abu Abayad say that once a girl reaches the age of nine, then the, ma the marriage may be consummated even without her consent. Repeat that again. <laughs> That may be consummated. You're laughing at that? Do you think it's funny? No, I think that's bad. That's pretty bad. Okay, good. So your laughter is disgust. You're laughing from disgust, right? Yeah, I don't agree with um, that consensus. You're not Muhammad. You're not the Muslims. You're not the Quran. You're not the Sunnah. That's why you need to leave. Read it again. If they disagree, then Ahmad and Abu Abayad say that once a girl reaches the age of nine, then the marriage may be consummated even without her consent. But that does not apply in the case of who is younger. Did you hear what I said? I said, if you're younger than nine, then you don't penetrate if she can't handle it. But when she's nine, penetrate away. And you kept telling me no. Um, yeah, there's a difference in opinion about what uh, what what qualifies as consent. Can you show me that and uh, what you just read? So you're making it up as well, you go along. Here's the second part that you're going to read. No, there's no. Okay, here. Let me give you the second part that cut off. Here it is. Stop making it up as you go along. I don't care for your opinion. Keep going. I'm just saying there is a difference in opinion. Malik al Shafi Abu Hanifa said the marriage may be consummate and the girl is able for intercourse, which varies from one girl to another. So no age limit can be set. This is the correct view. See what he's talking about? He's not talking about that we disagree when she's nine. It says that even if she's younger than nine, you can penetrate if she can handle it. There is nothing in the hadith of Aisha to set an age limit or to forbid that in the case of a girl who's able for it before the age of nine. That's the debate, buddy. Okay. Or to allow it in the case of a girl who is not able for it. And has reached the age of nine. So don't play these games with me, man. The debate is before nine. But there's no debate when she's nine. Because Aisha is the precedence. al Dawoodi said, Aisha was reached physical maturity at the time when her marriage was consummated. So even if, let's go with you. You're okay with this? That a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, ten-year-old? That if in case of a six, seven, eight-year-old, a 30-year-old man, if she can handle penetration, penetrates her in marriage, you're okay with this? I just want it on record. Are you okay with this? She would have to give consent, and I don't believe this. No, you just read. Accurate. You just read. If the father consents and she marries and she can handle penetration, it's okay. So if she can handle penetration. You okay with it? You sick bastard? Does no, I mean, mean no. The, no, the girl on. has to consent. Okay, if the six-year-old says yes, you okay with it? She would have to be of sound mind. I don't believe that would be of sound mind. So wait. Where does it say that a six-year-old cannot be married off unless she has a sound mind and she consents? Forget the penetration part. Do we need to reread this again? Uh, that's in the Quran. It says that. No, it doesn't say in chapter 65 verse 4. You're lying through your teeth. No, it says it in the Quran. Um, it doesn't oh, say it, it in the Quran 65 verse 4. I'm about to insult you for even trying to justify it. You filth. You're dangerous. The FBI should be on you. Can you give me your actual name so I can call the FBI on you? What's well, your it's actual a, name? It, it's a different verse than that. What's No, the verse you're quoting has nothing to do with marriage. It talks about orphans. I know what you're referring to. What's your name? You're dangerous. We need yeah, to find you. If you're you not married, you're considered an orphan technically how can you be considered an orphan if you have a mommy and daddy what's your name you're dangerous in america you need to be in jail because you're a pedophile can you translate sallallahu alayhi wasallam for me 
peace and blessings be upon No, it doesn't mean blessings. Let me repeat it again. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The word sallam means peace. There is no word blessing in that phrase. Can you literally translate sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Peace be upon him, I believe. No, peace be upon him is <clears throat> alayhi salam. Salam. The word for peace is salam. So let me okay. go back over the phrase again. Sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi upon him wa sallam. Salam is the word peace. What's the word sallam? Sallallahu. I don't know. You are literally saying May the prayers of Allah be on him and peace. Literally, salah is the word for prayer. When you pray five times a day, what do you call it in Arabic? Salah. Say it again. Salah. Now, let me repeat the phrase. Salah lahu. Salah lahu. The prayers of Allah. That's what it literally means. The word for blessing is baraka. Baraka. B-A-R-A-K in transliteration. So I'm going to ask you a question. You literally just said, the prayers of Allah be on him and peace. Yep. Who does Allah pray to when he prays for Muhammad? <laughs> Well, I think this is again the whole Arabic thing, so I don't. No, I'm giving you. The Arabic. I'm just gonna say I don't know it. Every answer, every question. So, well, let, let me repeat the Arabic for you. There are three words: baraka, blessing, not used in this phrase; salam, peace, which is used; and salah, which means prayer. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam literally means the prayers of Allah be upon him and peace. So that's Arabic. I've even written articles and I've debated Muslims on this. The word salah, salawat, plural for prayers. So I want to know, who does your God, Allah, pray to when he prays for Muhammad? You didn't answer the question. He prays for Muhammad. To who? Well, your prayers, you're going to talk to someone, right? To who? Who does he pray to when he prays for Muhammad? Well, I don't think he needs to pray to anyone. But he does. Sallallahu means he's praying. So is yeah. he praying to himself? Just praying. It doesn't say to anyone. Okay, so but when you pray, you just... You just pray and you're not praying to anyone? So when you pray you, to no one or you're praying to someone? It's my intention to pray to Allah, yes. So when Allah prays, is he praying to himself or he's just throwing out words out there for no one? It is, I don't know in Allah's intentions. So you can't tell what Allah is doing when he even tells you what he's doing when he gives you the words. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when it says sallam, what does sallam mean? Peace. So what does Allah do? Muhammad, peace. So what does Allah do? Give him peace, right? But how do you know? You don't know Muhammad's intentions. I mean, Allah's intentions. So how do you know he's giving peace? Because that's, see, this is your argument. Well, when Allah is uh, sallallahu prayer, I don't know what his intention is. But now you surely knew his intention that he wants to give Muhammad peace. So how do you know his intention was to give Muhammad peace? But when he prays, you don't know what his intention is. Well, he just, says, he just says he does. So it's... Okay, so he does. So he just prays and he just gives peace. But you don't know who he prays to, right? In 3356 of the Quran, it says, Allah and his angels pray upon the prophet and you who believe pray for him and salute him yeah right you salli alayhi you salli so it says allah and the angels perform salah on muhammad you salli right yep ala nabi okay when the angels perform salah they're praying who do they pray to they're praying for muhammad for but to angels, who yeah to who when they well, pray to who they're praying to i would assume allah so you it, it doesn't allah say anyway man if they don't pray to allah and they pray to themselves then that means they're committing shirk you just damned these angels to hell i didn't say they're playing to themselves okay so when it says allah and the angels you saloon ala nabi you saloon ala nabi yeah i don't i don't know arabic so okay well, i'm gonna translate it allah and his angels pray ala means over or upon the prophet so when the angels perform salah prayer who do they pray to do you need to really ask that question okay let's go with the second part and it says and you who believe salu alayhi you salu alayhi pray upon him pray upon muhammad when you pray for muhammad who do you pray to allah when the angels pray for muhammad who do they pray to when allah prays for muhammad who does he pray to that you don't know huh it doesn't say yes it does you just said it they said it because when it says allah and his angels pray and you pray you just admit for anyone, when angels and believers pray, it's to Allah. It's the same sentence. Allah, angels, and believers all pray. You can tell me that the angels and the believers pray to Allah, but you can't tell me who Allah prays to. All right, at least you're honest and you're wanting to live in denial. Okay, that's good. Now, the, the other question related to is, why are you praying for Muhammad? Is he not in a state of peace? Uh, just um, formalities, I guess. Oh, formality. So, yeah, yeah, you know, just Allah's wasting our time. Having us pray for Muhammad, it's just formality. Well, so you, don't, you don't believe in niceties, so I don't expect you understand. Can you show me where Allah says it's for formality and niceties? Or are you putting words in the no, mouth? I, of I was just saying that's what I, that's what I assumed it would be. I don't I'm not saying the Quran think. says this. You need to prove it because you can't just tell me your opinion. You're not a prophet. You're not a messenger. You're not an alim. You're not a scholar. You got to be careful what you say. Can you show me where in the Quran or the Sunnah says it's a nicety? It's a formality. Mm, I believe... There's a hadith somewhere. Formality and nicety? No, it doesn't say that. No, no, not that literally. Not that literally. In fact, didn't Muhammad say in the sound hadith 
that if, if you don't pray for him during the five times, five daily prayers, your prayer is incomplete and won't reach Allah. That's why when you pray five times a day, you do tashahud, don't you? Mm, yep. Okay. Can you repeat to me what tashahud is? Like, do you want the Arabic or what? Give me Arabic and translate it for me. Because they taught it to you, obviously. You've been praying for a year five times a day. Okay. Um, Go to Sheikh Google. I'll help you if you need. Sorry. No, I have it written down already. But yeah, go ahead. Slowly repeat the shahud and then translate it for everyone to see. I can just do English if you want. Well, can do the English because I want to make sure you translate it correctly. But go ahead, go do the English. Um, uh, all greetings of humility are for Allah and all prayers and goodness. Peace be upon you, O Prophet. Okay, bango, stop there. Say it again. Peace be upon you. Finish the sentence. Peace be upon you, O Prophet. Peace be upon you, O Prophet. And then what do you say? And the mercy of Allah and his blessings. Okay. Now, re repeat that one sentence. Peace be upon you, O Prophet. Repeat that entire sentence, that section that you have to pray five times a day. It has to be part of your prayer. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. Okay, now let me ask you a question. According to chapter 39, verse 30 of the Quran, it says, Muhammad shall die, and they will die, and Muhammad is dead and buried. You agree with that, right? Uh, Yeah. Okay, so he's dead. So can you, I can ask you a question. Why are you talking to a dead man thousands of miles away from his grave? Well, it says he will die. It doesn't mean that he's like dead right oh, now. Oh, so he's still alive. So all alive. He goes, you'll die, and they will die too. So those people died already. He goes, you will die, and they will die too. Didn't they die? Yeah, everyone will die eventually. And did Muhammad die? Uh, No, I don't believe so. Like, not. Well, you mean when they die, he died, and they buried him in Medina. That wasn't Muhammad. So who was it? Was it his genie? No, I mean, we taste death, but the soul hasn't died yet. That's The Quran doesn't qualify that if you die, it's not really death, because I'm telling you, it says you will die. Yes, I know what death is when your soul leaves, but you will die. And that's why, according to your Bukhari Muslim, when o Omar found out Muhammad died, he took a sword and he was going to kill anyone who said Muhammad died. And then Abu Bakr recited chapter 3, verse 144, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and the messengers before him have died. So when he dies, will you turn on your heels and abandon the faith? He recited that to remind Omar that the messenger died like all messengers die. So whether you like it or not, Allah is the ever-living, serve him. So do I need to repeat your history for you? So Muhammad died. So let's stop the tap dance. And they buried him three days later. So my question is, you're thousands of miles away from where Muhammad is dead and buried. Why are you talking to him in your prayer? Uh, I don't believe he's like dead. Oh, so you believe he's hearing you then? Oh, you do, huh? Okay. So in your five daily prayer, you, you speak to Allah and you speak to a dead man and you don't see that you're a pagan idolater because your five daily prayers are supposed to be directed to Allah where you talk to him. You just admit you talk to him and this dead man and you say he can hear you. So you're now talking to Allah and Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Who else do you yeah, talk I'm, to in your five daily yeah. prayers that are supposed to be offered to Allah? Who else do you talk to? Um, I believe, well, I don't, I'm not sure if Abraham hears it, but we do make... Uh, no, you don't you talk to Abraham. Abraham. No, you don't. What you do oh, is... Well, that's why I said, I don't know. If, I don't know if he hears it, but we No, uh, the you don't talk to Abraham. You ask Allah to pray for Muhammad and his family as you pray for Abraham's family and yeah. bless Muhammad and his family as you bless Abraham's family. That's not talking to, you're asking Allah to bless. But yeah. in this line, you're talking to Muhammad, peace be upon you, O Prophet. So who else do you talk to besides Allah and this dead man in your prayers five times a day? Mm, no one. No one else? I don't think so. So then you just admit, you talk to Allah five times a day, which is worship. Isn't the ibadah the heart of worship your prayer? So your five daily prayers are worship, right? And how do you worship Allah? By talking to him, right? Mm, by praying, yeah. Yeah, well, what is prayer? Talking to him, or are you just talking to the genie next to you? We're talking to him, right? Yeah. So just talking, but yeah. When you pray, you are talking and conversing. Do I need to get you a dictionary to what know what talking is? When I say, Oh Allah, that means I'm communicating. I'm I am talking. Yeah. yeah, right? Yeah, I'm speaking. Okay. So I want you to understand you just admit it's recorded. In your five daily daily prayers, which is the, the worship, the art of worship, you're talking to Allah and a dead man, and you still don't see how you just confirmed you're worshiping Muhammad like you worship Allah. Because you're talking to two persons in your five daily prayers which is the heart of your worship so you're dividing your worship between allah and this dead man and you're okay with it uh, he's not dead okay he's alive but you're okay with it though yeah oh okay i'm glad you dead, you're okay being a pagan an idolatrous pagan and now let me add to your paganism now your prophets kissed and smothered the black stone and when you perform hajj pilgrimage it is sunnah that you if you can if the crowds are too too long kiss and smother that black stone you okay with that too yeah it's a sunnah oh Okay, so you're okay with taking an inanimate stone, kissing it like your prophet did, and then touching it like your prophet did, and weeping on it like your prophet did, and you still don't say that you're a pagan idolater? 
Okay. Excellent. Beautiful. Emily, you're honest. And do you also believe that this stone is going to come to life and intercede for you? It's going to be given eyes and a tongue to intercede for you? Sure. Okay. And you also believe that it was white and turned black from you pagans kissing it, absorbing your sin? I haven't heard that. Oh, well, I'll give it to you right now. Hold on. Okay. I'm glad you admit that you are a blind, demonized idolater. May Jesus save you. I'm, I'm This is very, we're happy because we're excited to at least have a Muhammad admit He's a Mohammedan and he's a pagan, but he doesn't realize it. Thank you, sir. Hold on. Let me get you that. Appreciate you, man. Do I have time to change my laundry, if you don't mind? Oh, yeah. yeah go ahead. Because you're going to need no. to. I know. Maybe you soiled yourself. You're probably going to have to change. <laughs> go ahead. It makes me laugh. I like you, buddy. <laughs> you guys funny, dude. I think he's just having fun at my expense. He laughed. At least he's good, right? Good kid, man. Pray for him. Maybe he's making fun. That's okay. Maybe they just sent him here. That's fine. But at the same time, maybe he's open and he's not that hard and God will save him. He sounds familiar, though. I've heard from him. I've heard him somewhere. I don't know where, but at least he's he's a good kid. You can tell he's got a good spirit. He's just been blinded. Poor guy. I'm starting to feel sorry for him. Yeah. Okay. Sure. No problem. Yeah. I'm a pagan. Fine. Yeah. I'm idolater. Yeah. In my five daily prayers, which is worship, I speak to Allah on a dead man, but he's not dead, but it's okay. I can still speak to him. And this is not anything analogous to communion of saints, by the way. It's not analogous to communion of saints. I've already done shows showing why, because Muhammad said, dua, invocation, invocation, prayer is worship. We don't believe that. Christianity does not teach, the Bible does not teach that prayer in every instance is an act of worship. No, it's not. But anyway, we're waiting for him. Now, guys, I guess I gave you the link to the hadith. Who is he? You know, he's laughing. Here you go. Here it is. Here's the link again. Kitab al Hajj, book 24, from Sunan Nasai, Nasai, Sunan Nasai, volume 3, book 24, hadith 29 22. Hassan, it's good. What does it say? I'm just waiting for him to come back. All right, there you go. Yeah, can you pray to Ancestor Sam? Uh, if you know the saints are in heaven, Yes, you can ask them to intercede, but I don't know if your ancestors in heaven because I don't know if you're going to make it to heaven, Peterson. The way you're going, you're probably going to end up in hell if you don't repent, okay? Are you back, buddy? Because I can hear your mic. At least I heard your mic. There. He sounds like the kid that said Finima. Oh, really? I don't know, Joe. I, I've heard him before, but I don't know where. Anyway, I just want him to yeah, admit it. These guys, at least he's honest. Yeah, yeah, I do speak to a dead man, but he's not dead. He's alive. And my five daily prayers, which is the heart of worship. So I'm speaking to Allah and Muhammad, which means that he is now dividing his worship to Allah and Muhammad. <clears throat> And then I'm okay with kissing a black stone and smothering it like my prophet did because it raises sins. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, Peterson, you need to repent because of that comment shows you haven't repented and you're a fake and on your way to hell. And if you don't repent, I'm going to have to muzzle you for being that stupid. Because I don't know if your ancestor Sam is in heaven. I don't know if you're going to make it to heaven. But I know the Blessed Mother's in heaven. Paul is in heaven. And they're alive and perfected unlike you. So shut your mouth, <clears throat> Peterson, before I have to muzzle you. Okay. Okay. Anyway, we'll wait for him. Okay, folks, let me share hey, the I'm back. I'm back. Okay, now here, I guess here's the link. Uh, do you mind removing that? What? Comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Has it been there for how long? Damn, I, just, I, didn't know. I didn't even know I put that up. Honestly, I didn't think I had put that up. Sorry about that, friend. You was talking about Muhammad. Anyway, here, uh, here's a link for you, buddy. You, you see it? I just sent it to you. Go to the comment section. Can you open it up? Oh, yeah, I see it. In the private chat, not comments. Sorry. Yeah, the yeah, private yeah, 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 I see. It. Okay, open it up. Can you read it for us? Yeah. Okay. All right, Peterson, if you're being sincere and if you're not mocking, because I'm going to give you benefit of doubt, even though I don't believe you. Because when you say ancestor Sam, you are mocking. But I'll give you the benefit out. And because you're going to have to answer the Jesus Christ for every stupid word that comes out of your mouth. So if you're lying, you're going to answer to him. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on all of us. Who says, can I pray to ancestor Sam if they're not mocking? See, that's why I don't trust you. But that's okay. Now, can you read the hadith for us? It was narrated from Abdullah ibn Ubaid bin Umayr that a man said, Oh, Abu Abdurrahman, why do I only see you touching these two corners? He said, I heard the messenger of Allah say, Touch the, touching them erases sins. Does what? The two erases black corners, sins. one of them includes the black stone. So does what? Erases sins. Oh, so touching the and two corners, before you move on, touching the two corners, one of them includes the black stone corner. Erases your sin, huh? Are you okay with that? So a black stone that's an inanimate object that can neither harm nor benefit you, according to Umar ibn al-Khattab. But if you kiss it and touch it and weep on it, it will then erase your sin, and it turned black from all the sins of those who touched it and kissed it. And then Allah will bring it to life and give it a tongue and eyes to intercede for you. So this black stone is going to be your intercessor, and you have no problem. Um, I'm not trying to be disagreeable, but do you have... When it says yeah, it I, becomes black. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dude, come on, man. Don't make it easy for me, sir. Here, let me get it for you. Here it is. Here's the hadith. There you go, buddy. Thank you. Dude, can you make it a little hard for me? You're making it too easy. Here it is. Here's the hadith. Here's the link trying for you. to be difficult. No, it's all right, man. I'm not. I'm just saying. But I'm, yeah, here it is. Here's the link. I just sent you a private chat. Can you open it up? Uh, Shia, if you make Hajj, 
you kiss the black stone and Shia, you do worse. What you do is you slice yourself with knives and you bleed for your fake God, like the prophets of Baal, Shia waves. You take knives and you take swords and you'll cut yourselves and ble bleed for your God. And you'll even cut the heads of your children, bleed for your God, just like the prophets of Baal. So you do worse. If you make Hajj, you lick the black stone. And on top of that, you cut yourself and you turn yourselves into a bloody mass. For your God, just like the prophets of Baal. So you're worse, yeah. Go ahead, read it for me, bro. My brother and you, man. Uh, Ibn Abbas narrated that the Messenger of Allah said, The black stone descended from the paradise, and it was more white than milk, and it was blackened by the sins of the children of Adam. You caught it? So yep. do I need to give you more hadiths to prove that whatever I'm telling you, I try to be as solid and factual as possible. I make mistakes, but that's not intentional. So you're okay. I just want everyone to understand. You're okay with this inanimate black stone that was there before Muhammad that was venerated by the pagans in Arabia, that you're okay with kissing it, touching it, weeping on it. You're okay with it turning black from your sins, and you're okay with it erasing your sins if you venerate it, and you're okay with it coming to life, where Allah will give it eyes and a tongue to then intercede for you, to save you, and appease Allah to forgive you. You're okay with all that? Uh, Sure. All right. Yeah. And so you really don't see you're a pagan idolater, huh? Nope. All right. Uh, next slide, man. Whatever floats your boat. I'm, just, I'm glad that you're okay with it. Now, yeah. why did your prophet adopt the pagan practice? And why did Omar, when he went to kiss the black stone, he goes, I know that you're a stone that neither benefits nor harms. Had I not seen the messenger of Allah kiss you, I would not kiss you. So why did he adopt this pagan practice? Because the pagans were venerating the black stone. Allah Walam, I don't know. Allah oh, Allahu Alam, I don't know. Interesting. Okay, so here you're telling me you became a Muslim because the concept of God, Allah is just and this and that. And yet, all of these issues that you have been asked about and you have no clue why you do them or why Muhammad did them, and you're okay with it. Okay, amazing. Now, are you okay with what the Quran teaches when it comes to sexual ethics? Are you okay with that? You are, huh? So you, you would you marry a nine-year-old? Um, No. Are you okay with your Muslim brother? Your brother in faith marrying a nine-year-old? Mm, that's up to him. Say yes, because if you say no, you condemn chapter 65, verse 4 of the Quran. You condemn what the Hadith say and the example of your prophet. So uh, are you okay uh, with a, a Muslim brother, a brother in arms, who prays next to you, shoulder to shoulder, let's say he's in his 20s and 30s, then he goes marries a nine-year-old and has sex with her? I don't know the thick of the actual issue, like if it was What's ever it? changed. It's in every fit Hadith, every scholar will tell you that Muhammad married a nine-year-old, and it is acceptable Islam, especially on the basis of 65 verse 4. Anyone who tries to prohibit it is a Catholic. Yeah, in the West, you can't do it. So let me now rephrase the question. You're living in Afghanistan, and your Muslim brother asked this man, I want to marry your daughter. I am in my 30s. She is nine. Here's the dowry. And the man says, sure. And then he takes that nine-year-old to his bed, and he deflowers her. Are you okay he said the man. That would be me, right? I would be that man. No, I said your Muslim brother. You said I'm in. You said I'm in Afghanistan. Yeah, with your Muslim brother. You want to make it Muslim sister? Did you hear that? Fool? You are in Afghanistan, and your Muslim brother. That's what I said. Are you okay with that? If she is mature and of sound mind, it's the. What nine year old is mature to have a thirty year old penetrating her? Depends on the situation. Depends on situation. So, do you have a sister that's nine? Do you have anyone that's a child in your family? Because you need to be arrested because you're dangerous for what you just said. She if you have that. children, someone needs to report you. Because you are a pedophile and you sanction pedophilia. You are sick if and you dangerous. believe that. If you believe that, go ahead. Yeah, I, if I knew where your contact information, I would warn the FBI. I said, we got a sick, deviant Mohammedan who has no problem with Muslims preying on minors. Because that's what you just said. Yeah. Oh, no big deal. No big deal taking someone's nine-year-old. I have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. If you and your filthy Mohammedans came near them, I'd be in jail for murder. If you were to dare get near my daughters. Well, you would, you would have to consent. So you don't consent, then there's no issue. 